Good morning, church family. Good morning. Um, I'm okay, by the way, if other people want to preach, and I'm happy. I just enjoyed the presence of God this morning. I enjoyed the worship. I enjoyed the word. Um, it came into my spirit this morning, actually. It's our verse that when uh, our oldest member uh, was buried a few weeks ago here from the church, and it was a verse of scripture God gave me, by grace, you are saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. And it's quite amazing when you really understand the scripture that there's absolutely nothing you can do to earn favor with God except accept Christ. And when you accept Christ, you come into all of the bounty, everything that Christ is, the Father says he'll be to you. And so the power and the provision and the favor it, it, it took me a long time to understand this, by the way, but it becomes absolutely incredible that by simple faith and belief, I become everything that Christ is to the Father. And that's why, church, you can't, it's not seven steps to a better you. You might read a book like that and try to improve yourself and all of those things. Or, you know, in, in the past, people would, um, I know old Martin Luther used to climb up the steps and to try and get approval from God till his knees actually bled until he heard the word of the Lord, and it was an Old Testament word. It says, the just shall live by faith. And when you go back into the father of faith, who is Abraham, it says, Abraham believed God. And because he believed, God put a credit to his account and called him righteous. That's the gospel this morning. Like if you move away from that, it becomes complicated. If you understand that, then as Jesus said to his disciples, don't hold, for, don't hold don't hold forgiveness from people. Tell people so when they come into a gathering or when they're your company, God has already offered forgiveness. All he wants you to say, I accept his forgiveness. Right. And that's a simple gospel. And I, I, I might ramble on a little bit this morning. I, to be honest, I don't even know where I'm going this morning with the word. But I want to just tell you this morning, if you forget everything else, grasp that and walk out and say, I can be accepted by the Father because I believe in the Son. That's why Jesus said, he that believeth. You remember the song? We were singing old songs this morning. You remember the song? If you don't say yes or amen this morning, I might get you to sing it. He that believeth. Come on, he that believeth. On the Father and the Son hath everlasting life. When I get to heaven. The second row, you want to do it? I'm going to walk all around. I'm going to sit down, amen, by my Savior. So it's good to be in the house. If you're here for the first time, we're very blessed you're here. If I never see you again, I just hope you'll leave better. It's not really me or Zelda or Joel or the team or deacons or anybody that you want to see this morning. We just hope that you encounter him and you say, you know what? I didn't realize God was as good as he was. And it becomes an encouragement to your faith. So we're here to build you up. We're not a house that beats you up. We're here to encourage you. Martin Luther, I'm going to quote him again. I don't know why he's in the spirit this morning. But uh, Martin Luther said a couple of good things. He said, I need to hear hear the gospel every day because I forget the gospel every day. And I need to be reminded of how good God is. I need to be reminded that the journey I'm on, I need to be reminded that God has saved me. It's a work of God. And he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Give me a big amen in the hall. Amen. If you're not used to saying amen, say amen. amen. If you're not used to saying praise the Lord, say praise the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am anointed, but I'm normal. I'm not weird. I'm normal. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I had, I had the joy. Can I tell you something else? Um, you, know, you all know I have four children. The youngest is 20. The oldest is 29. I have two daughter-in-laws. And for the last, I guess... 29 years, which includes Joel, my kids fiddle with the car. Do, do you, if you're, as a parent, when you're driving your car, and you have the heat a certain way, your music a certain way, you, you have your visor down, they fiddle with stuff. And I have it, I maybe have it sitting at 24 because I'm cold. They have it at 16. And so for years I've been telling my kids, don't fiddle with the car. Don't put your music on over my music and all of that. So I had the joy this morning because I was almost late. But I had the joy this morning of young Joyce, my youngest boy, collecting me in the mini. And we get into the mini. As we started to travel, I put my hand over here. He was, don't touch. 
And I thought, everything is reversing. Everything. I've either trained him very well or I've trained him very badly, but everything is reversing. He's now telling me, don't touch the heat, don't touch the music. In fact, I get into the car and I said, your music's very loud, you're going to go deaf. What does that tell you about me this morning? It tells you. <laughs> it tells you that I'm getting older. That's all I'm saying. Music's too loud. Turn it down. Amen. Couldn't be church. Turn, turn that down. Turn the lights off. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I have the spirit of my father on me this morning. <laughs> Uh, he was away with Darren, by the way, and to Malvern Assembly. And uh, it's great. Darren's given his testimony. Uh, Billy and Lorraine, who pastor up there in the Shankill Road, they're dear friends of ours. And they're up there giving their testimony. Um, and uh, I said to my dad, well, what are you preaching on? What do you think my dad said? What do you think when I asked my father, you all know, anybody that sits in the, in the anointed table, knew the anointed table here after the service, you have to be there by invite, by the way. What do you think when father sits, he holds court? What do you think he said when I said, what are you preaching on? He said, the platform. 100% a dad joke this morning, amen. Good to be, uh, good to be here. Um, good to be in the house. I'm going to say some things this morning. I don't know how far we'll get, but... When I feel in my spirit, I'm ready to stop. I'm going, I'm going to stop this morning. God is not a future goal. Neither is God a, a past movement. But he is a right to second place in your life. Amen. This waits for amen. Amen. You, you, you are... When you get saved, saved means I believe in God, right? I believe, accept, repentance, I believe in God. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. Now when Adam, when Adam fell in the garden, the glory of the Lord departed. God pursued him, but, but he was no longer clothed with the glory of God. That's why the first thing Adam said, and you talked about the fig leaf, it's the first thing he said, we're naked. Well, he was naked before he fell. But he wasn't aware. We are, we are aware of our minds. We are aware of our emotions. We are aware of the eternal. When, you, when, you, when you're clothed with God, all you're aware of is him. And so when he fell in sin, the glory of God come, come off Adam. And up until Christ came to shed blood and people come to believe, there was no, no one was ever filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sheds blood, he makes a, it's, it becomes a legal term for the Holy Spirit now to come into your heart. That's why the enemy can't bring an accusation against you. Because the blood has cleansed you. And now the, the vindication is that the Holy Spirit, the spirit that Adam lost, now comes into the believer's heart. It's actually a sealing of the new covenant. It's, it's a cutting, cutting of the heart. He takes away the old heart. He gives you a new heart. He doesn't give you two hearts. It's not an old man and a new man. It's not, you're not spiritually schizophrenic. Right? You are a whole person like God is whole. And so the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. And now rather than searching and not be able to find God, what, what the psalmist says, deep the spirit now calls out the deep. You, you now have a, an unbroken communication with your father. Amen. 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 Oh, man, it's, it's, like, it's like before we didn't know. Before you get saved, you're not sure. You, you see aspects of God. You, you, you hear people talking about God. But when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes in, you, you now have communion with God. It's, it's a union. It's an abiding presence of God. When 30 years ago, when we were looking through the Belfast Telegraph all night, remember the Belfast Telegraph? Remember you looked at the job place? place and Zelda said to me, she's very wise. Zelda said to me, I think mobile phones could be the future. Now, for young people who are here, that means nothing to you. <laughs> Amen. Let me just tell you, I grew up in this estate, and when we wanted to speak to somebody, we went into an old red phone box, which spelt, by the way, and I would ring my mom, and I would, do, I would say to the operator, would you do a reverse charge call and say what time do you need to be home for tea <laughs> with my Casio watch? Wrong people, you have no idea. You talk about stress. You talk about all those things that you have. Amen. We had it hard. Amen. Don't tell that to the war generation, but it was difficult. If you wanted to meet your friend, young people, you, you organized it the week before. 
If you wanted to speak to somebody in America or Africa, you wrote a letter. <laughs> it was called pen pal. <laughs> You have no idea of the hardships that we were under. So when Zelda says to me 30 years ago, I think mobile phones are going to be in the future, she was a prophetess. <laughs> and so I joined this mobile phone trade, which I really didn't like for the first few months. Um, but I, I realized that if you were in the UK and you wanted to go to America, that the signal was different. Because we, we operated on a certain, nine, well, it's 900 gigahertz, but we operated on a certain signal. And so when you went at the, wanted to go to America for your holidays, you could take your phone, but it didn't work. There was no connection because you had to have a different phone. You had to have a different signal. Right now, that doesn't mean anything to you. What I'm, what I'm trying to say to you, before you get born again, before you say, Lord, because on the first day of the church, after Peter stood up and preached about who Christ was and what God had done in covenant, you know what they asked? What must we do to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, which is metanoia. It doesn't mean just turn away from your sin. It actually it means to turn to him. It's more than just the no. It's the yes. Right? It's more than just, we taught it in the church, in the evangelical church, we've taught it as the no. But actually God, the word metanoia, is a transformation of your thinking. And what happens when you say yes, the Spirit of God comes into your heart, and He gives you a new heart, and He gives you a new mind. And what begins to happen is you now, your, trans, your transmitter is to Him. And you begin to hear His voice. And you begin to hear what Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And it's not cryptic, and I give unto them eternal life, and none shall pluck them out of my hands. Do you understand? So you're sitting there this morning, you're a transmitter of heaven, and you're not trying to call God down because God says, When you come, my Holy Spirit's come, I'm going to abide in you, and I'm going to walk with you. So you have, you have the abiding presence. Does that make sense to everybody this morning? So you are filled with the Spirit of God. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to restore us to the original design that we are meant to be from the beginning. What was the original design of Adam? God puts him in a perfect place. God puts him in a perfect work. He puts him in a complete work. He puts him in a fruitful work. God actually says over and over again, what I've done is good. Everything I've done. He doesn't put Adam in to build something. He puts Adam in to shirt something. And what God says to Adam, now I want you to co-labor with me. Let us co-labor together because the word is already in the seed. And we're going to caver Lula and we're going to subdue the earth and have dominion together. That was the original word to our first parents. And when the Holy Spirit comes in the New Testament, God is wanting to restore the original design. And the original design is not just the souls of men to know him. It begins there. But Jesus said, I want to restore that. He uses the word that which was lost. In other words, the systems that were in Eden. The economy that was in Eden. The instruction that was in Eden, do you know in Eden that it said every night that the Lord God would appear with Adam and he would walk with Adam in the cool of day. He would be downloading, he would be learning from the creator. Now how does this work? What happens when we do that with that animal? What happens when we take that fruit and we multiply it? And he, God is teaching him stewardship. He's teaching him to listen to the creator, but he's saying it is you that subdues the earth and has dominion. So God is looking to put us back to the original design. How do you see life? How do you see life this morning? Like what, what, is your, what is your lenses that you put on to see the world? Do you have biblical glasses? Right? I have, I have a biblical worldview. I, I have a worldview that tells me, that tells me, I'm just going to make the statement, you can work it out for yourself. But it tells me by all of the evidence, by all of the genealogy, that the world is no, no, no older than 6,000 years old. That human beings haven't been on the planet any more than 6,000 years. I've been to the pyramids of Giza. I've been to the, what do you call the place you guys didn't like over in England? Stonehenge. There is no written records beyond 4,000 B.C. 
When you look at the genealogy, when God writes in the New Testament, he writes in Matthew and Mark, he begins with genealogies, and the genealogy goes back to Adam, and when you trace it right back, even though they lived a long time, you come to the fact that there is a creator, and there is a purpose in the earth, church. So how you see the world, where you believe you came from, did you think you evolved? Did you think the earth is 14.5 billion years old? And out of nothing, everything just out of chaos. I mean, I mean, in this country, we understand when you have a big bang, it doesn't create anything. It destroys everything. But when God creates, it's good, church. And so I have a biblical worldview. I have, a, I have an understanding of what God, what is God looking to do with human beings? What God is looking to do in the nations? What is going on in the world? I'm going to touch a little bit on this this morning. So how you see life is determined from what world you flow from. If you flow from this world, you, you will try to work out all of the complexities and all of the, the voices and all of the media from this world. But if you flow from kingdom, you begin to understand World events, you begin to understand history, you begin to understand what your purpose is in the planet. Yeah. I know I was a little bit deep, forgive me for that this morning, but I just, so I think we just need to maybe edge a little bit this morning. <laughs> Jesus had a prayer. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, he had a prayer. What did he say to them? I want you to pray as it is in heaven. Yeah. Come on, talk to me, church. As it is in heaven, so let it be on earth. That was, that was the prayer that he was teaching the new people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to pray that my world comes to your world. We have, we have been sold a lesser version of God. I, I don't know whether it's been we didn't have the revelation. But I, I think that we have, we have accepted like a low-level version of God. And we, 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 sort of, we sort of muse around this is what it looks like in Christianity or in religion. We, by the way, we don't do religion in this church. The word religion means to bind, so we don't bind people. When you know him, you're freed, right? And so, so we have this low-level version of God that God himself has not purposed for his church or for his people. In, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet is prophesying to our generation, Isaiah chapter, chapter 60 and 61 and 62 and he says this word, he says, arise and shine for your light has come. He's prophesying to our generation. And I want to just say to you, if you're, if you're a believer this morning, you're already in your light. The light has already come. You're already in the kingdom. You already have, as you know, I've said it week after week, you already have a revival spread. So that the nations and the people around about could come in and flow under the blessing and the wisdom of God. Because his ways, church, in his ways life works and in his ways life flourishes. It's God's original purpose that you would flourish, that you, you, you would abound, that you would have bounty in your life and how, how it flows. I am so glad this morning that we, we are no longer standing at the Jordan waiting to get into the promised land, prophesying, I want to get into the promised land. It's a little bit like Adam. Adam's put on, in a finished work. Israel were put in a, in a place that they didn't build, houses they didn't build. They were put in the promised land. What is the promised land for the believer? It's the kingdom of God. So I said, I said every week, because I'm trying to get your theology in the right place, everybody who believes is already in the promised land because you're in the kingdom of God. It is a land of promises that we have been brought in. The cross finishes the new covenant. You, you, you are not working towards trying to get approval from God. You're not working toward a mark. You are starting from, from a, the cross that already finishes the new covenant. The kingdom opens to us the realms of promises, and the mandate is heaven to invade earth. And that mandate is upon every believer, upon every disciple of Jesus Christ, that everywhere you go, heaven, you carry heaven with you, that heaven begins to invade earth. That we're no longer wandering or wandering. I try to, sometimes in our accents, you can say flower and flower, and it's two different things. It can be something that grows in the ground or something you use for baking. Flower, flower. <laughs> But, but I said wandering, or wandering, that's not what happens when you come into Christianity. You no longer wander, 
You might wonder at his glory and his majesty, but you're no wondering of who you are. You come in to the fullness like Adam on the first day of everything the Lord God has given us. Amen, church. And the secret of life is how you steward it. The secret of life. If I could, if I could impart any wisdom, whatever wisdom I have, I, I would say in my Christian life, I'm trying to learn to steward what's already in my hands. That's one of the things that he says to Adam. I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and re replenish the earth. This is, this is what God is looking for us to do. He's looking for us to, to steward the promises. How do I steward life? How do I steward wisdom? How do I steward the Holy Spirit? How do I steward a life that is already won? Because if you're a believer, you have a life that is already won. Amen. Amen. We have been slow learners, at least I have been. So let me exclude you this morning. <laughs> we have been slow learners in grace. It's taken us a long time to believe in our own conversion. And by the way, that was really good what I said there. Much of our understanding in grace, the grace of God and the new covenant. Do you, know, do, you know what I, do you know what it's taken me a long time? The first thing it took me a long time to understand that I was righteous. You would be amazed how many people come into churches, come into the house of God and don't understand that they're righteous by belief. You'd be amazed at how many come to the breaking of bread and go through a whole process in their mind of what they're not instead of looking to the Lamb for what He is. You would be amazed how many people don't understand by belief you can be made righteous. In fact, I heard a guy during the week, I don't know what movement he was from, but he was slating anyone that has a belief that it's Jesus alone for salvation. It's absolutely incredible. I couldn't even believe what I was hearing online, that you could, you could by belief alone in Jesus have eternal life. Actually, for the Father to deem you righteous, and I often think about the thief on the cross. He was never at a Bible study. He didn't know the doctrine of salvation. He didn't, he didn't know justification by faith. He didn't know what we talk about prophetic end times. He just said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He says, I'm going to remember you. And someday you're going to meet a man that's never been to church, but he's saved. Come on, come on, church. But no point in me getting excited. <laughs> it took me a long time to understand that, that righteousness is by faith in the work of another. That I could be justified as if I've never sinned. That I could be like the book of Ephesians says, blameless before the Father. That I could be as righteous, I want to say something, it's not blasphemous, but I could be as righteous as Christ because of my belief in him. And that's the indictment of the enemy. That's the indictment of the voice that comes against you to constantly say to you, you're not worthy. You shouldn't be in the house. You shouldn't be in the worship team. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be there. And you know what the Lord does in the Old Testament when he comes? He says he just rebukes the enemy for your sake. And the indictment is that we as sinners are now made holy in the house of the Lord. It took, it took me a long time. And by the way, the Reformation was millions killed just by that one statement I've made. That the just should live by faith in the work of another. And the priest comes in the Old Testament and the people were to bring the lamb to the priest and we've heard it loads of times. So I'm, I'm really being simple this morning. And forgive me for being simple, but I just feel this at the tenure of the service. But when they come to bring the lamb, they don't examine the people that brought the lamb. <laughs> they examine the lamb. That's what you do at communion. You examine the lamb. And you say, my belief and my trust in the Lamb of the precious said blood of Jesus Christ, of a life that was living worthy. He, he, he did not have any sin. He did never, never violated any law. But the Bible says he became sin, that you knew sin, that I could become the righteousness of God. Amen. And that is, that is the crux of your identity this morning. 
That is what churches have debated over and people have lost their lives on that simple truth that I can be made righteous and go to heaven because of what Jesus Christ done on the cross. He became sin that knew the sin that I could become. See, if you're going through a hard day and a hard bit of trouble, you're confused about ministry, I would say just shift yourself away back to that verse. Get back to what the core of it's all about. John sees him, you know, John, his cousin who was also the last of the Old Testament prophets, he, when he sees him, what does he say? What does he say about the Lamb of God? What does he say about the Father? What does he say about the Father who would come in the Son? And he walks, he walks in sandals. You forget he was fully God, but he was fully man. It's a mystery, church, it's a mystery. John sees him, and he knew him, but he sees him after the Spirit, and he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then I'm not going to go into the graphic detail, but I'm going to touch a little bit. On, there was nothing left of his back when they, when they, when they whipped him. Because all of the wrath of the Father, who, who, who has to by justice deal with sin. Because he's, he's, a, he's a good judge. But he says all of the wrath for sin was placed on him. And in the Old Testament, he says, I'm going to raise him up mighty for the task. And that's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane says, if it's possible, Father, take this cup. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And he goes to Calvary and he sheds his blood. And nobody takes his life when he's made the seven statements of the cross, which are all prophetic. When he says, now it's finished. The thing that the Father and the Son agreed before time began, before Adam fell, before you were even in your mother's womb, before you even the first day sinned, before you for the first day were confused, the thing he says, Father, we're going to do this for them. And I know they're going to turn their back on me. And I know they're going to hide. And I know they're going to go into sin. And I know they're going to rebel. And I know they're going to curse my name. But not my will. Nevertheless, I've set my face as a task for them. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's surely a cop in the house this morning. And he didn't turn away. And all of the wrath, listen to what the word says. All of the wrath was placed in him so that you could go free. So you should never, ever come into the house of the Lord. And think God is judging you in the house of the Lord. Never. It's an indictment to what happened in the cross to reenact the cross in the house again. God, God is not angry with you. He, all of his anger was placed upon his son so that he could have peace and fellowship with you. He actually says in the book of Isaiah, it's like the waters of Noah. Do you know what happened in the waters of Noah? The whole earth was destroyed. This is why you never buy into the lie that floods are going to come and the earth's going to be destroyed by a flood. And you watch all of these movies from Hollywood. It's just poppycock. Poppycock's not a Bible word, but I guarantee you we could find something similar. I can't spell poppycock, but it's poppycock. God says through Isaiah that what I'm going to do in this generation is going to be like the waters of Noah but I'm going to make a covenant of peace. In other words, what he said, I'm going to cover the whole earth with the waters of grace. And the waters of mercy. And the waters of peace. And everyone who comes in to say, Lord, I just believe in this. Will have my grace and power and provision and presence. Amen, church. When you come in to... Christ, you always have his favor. 
Psalm 65 says, Thou will bless the righteous with favor, thou shalt surround them. Because everything that Christ is, that the Father is to the Son, when you, when you believe you're, you're brought into the same favor, the same, the same presence, the same power. God doesn't, God doesn't come upon your life and then leave. I, 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 know, I know that's been in some of your minds. I know that's been some of our journey to try and get through this. But in the Old Testament, he came upon. It, it, you would read often, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon. And then the Spirit of the Lord left. The Spirit of the Lord went into the temple. And then the Spirit of the Lord left. But Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when you come into the New Testament, because of blood, there is an abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And you have constant favor. Like when Jesus comes into the temple in Luke chapter 4 and he announces a jubilee. Jubilee was, every, jubilee was every 50 years. But Jesus was coming into the temple and he said, I'm going to announce a jubilee. But it's going to be permanent. You're not going to have to wait for 50 years. You're constantly going to be under the favor and the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God's presence always, God, I, just, I wanted to say it again to you, God won't leave you. God, God, God won't allow you to come to a mountain or, or a Red Sea and say, ooh, I don't think they've really been trusting me the way they should have been trusting me. I'm going to abandon them at the Red Sea. That's not what God does. That's not the type of God that we serve. God has come and said, I'm going to be with you always, even until the end of the earth. Even when you don't feed me, I'm going to be there. Amen. Sin question dealt with. Oh, wow. It, it, it doesn't really matter how other people see you. It matters how God sees you in Christ. And God sees you in Christ as blameless. When God deals with sin, he deals with sin that is past, on the cross, present, and future. Like he brings you into a place where the blood has a permanence over your life to cover you from sin. And we need to talk. I'm so glad this morning that we sung about the blood. We need to sing about the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, that cleanses us from all sin. God says in the Old Testament, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgression from you. When you come into the new covenant and you read in Hebrews, and I'm so glad they're in Hebrews, but when you come into Hebrews, he said, your sins and your lawless deeds I won't remember anymore. And this becomes the cause of the new covenant that God doesn't deal with you after sin, but after his son. So what is the solution for us when we are so sin conscious? We are so sin conscious in the church. The solution is to become more son conscious. The solution is to, to read more about him, what he has done, what his work has done. Become a son conscious church. Amen. 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 Holiness. You're either holy or you're not. Holiness is not what you were. Because if it was, some of you are going to hell. <laughs> It's, it's not about what you wear. It's not about, it's, it's not about uh, how many rules you keep. This was the failure of the old covenant. The old covenant was they wanted to keep the rules. In the Bible, there's a, there's a tragedy verse that says that, that they failed on every part of the law. They failed in trying to keep it all. And Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that we are rule keepers. See, we would rather have, we would rather have a journey with God that says if you can do seven, seven steps here, then you're in. We would rather have, we would ha rather have, we would rather not bring the lamb. We would rather bring the fruit of the ground like Abel did. Yes. Right? So we prefer to have seven steps to get to God. Or for some people, if I can keep the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments are good. You shouldn't kill somebody. There will be a consequences if you do that. You shouldn't steal from somebody. There will be a consequences. God put it in there. It's not that the Ten Commandments are wrong. But God wants to do something different where, where he doesn't want you to have a commandment-led life, which is an exterior life. Because he called the Pharisees whited sepulchers. I never want to be called a whited sepulcher. What God wanted to do in the New Testament was put his Holy Spirit in you that you would love him. Yes. And that you would love a person, Jesus Christ. Yes. 
and that you would hear his voice. And the voice is higher than the law because, the, because you know, you can have all of the law and you can hate your brother. You can have wrong motivations of the heart. So what Jesus does, Jesus knows this about us. And so he looks at the Pharisees, he looks at everybody else, and he says, actually, if you've thought it, you've done it. And then everybody goes, oh, we're all finished. <laughs> we're all finished. Because there's no one alive, and there's no one in this building, there's no one online that's always had a pure thought. So what Jesus does, he knows he has to kill it because what he's looking for is a relationship with you. And now you have of what Isaiah 30 says, you will hear a voice inside you saying, this is the way and I walk you in it. He said, give me an amen. It helps me know that I should still keep going. If not, I'll just wrap it up. We can sing. What I'm trying to do is get something into you this morning. Holiness is not something you progress to be. It's an awakening of what you already are. Jesus said, I've sanctified myself that I might sanctify them. When you hear the word holiness, for me growing up, holiness, I'd pretty, I was pretty afraid of the word holiness. I made sure I shined my shoes on a sun Saturday night and all, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And, and I guess it was an honest attempt to try, an honest attempt to try and reverence that. God's house, it, it, that, I'm not knocking it this morning, I'm just trying to tell you that it's a, but when you, when you come into Christ, and we read it in John 17, he says, Father, bring them into everything we are, all of our glory, all, all, all of the love that you have for me, all, all that I am, I want it, I want it to be in them. And so when, when you hear this invitation, which is actually a declaration, be you holy, as I am holy, it's not, it's actually, I don't want to use the term, it's not an invitation, it's a declaration over your life of what you are. So when you have, an, when you have, a, when you have a seed of an, ache, uh, an oak tree, it's no less an oak tree. Right? When you get saved, you are no less holy. It's not like you're going to do another 40 years and you're going to be better than the first day. It doesn't happen. It's called progressive sanctification, and it is not Bible as far as I'm concerned. What happens is you grow up into what God already determines and already declares you to be. So when he says, be you holy as I am holy, he's saying, you're already holy. Now walk like your father says you are. And it's not about rules. It's about, do you know what, church? It's about your mind, your emotions. It's about your well-being. It's the prosperity of the soul. It's about how you live life. It becomes whole in relationships. It becomes well. It becomes honest in relationships. This is, this is authentic holiness. So when I see it now, I run to it. Because the Old Testament, the psalmist said, worship, thy testimonies are very sure. And holiness becomes your highest. Do you know what God does in holiness? He rebuilds you. He takes the mind that's confused and he heals the mind. Yeah. He gives you the mind of Christ. He takes the emotions. How many know that sometimes your emotions can be all over the place? Yeah. Don't think it's just teenagers going through. <laughs> Adolescents. I think our emotions can be all, our emotions can play havoc with our mind. Yeah. But your spirit's perfect. And so what God is after, God is after a whole. He's not after you to be a clone of me. You're not a mistake. You are a real version of yourself. What God wants to do when he, when he saves you, like, like uh, 1 John says, he wants to prosper you internally. He wants you to be the well-being inside of you, that just, the salvation that touches your mind, body, emotion, and spirit begins to flow over to how you live life. That's true holiness. Amen. 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 Come on, church. And our identity, our identity, what's your identity this morning? I think the devil's after young people. I, 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 think, I think the onslaught of the world and the media is trying to steal our young people where they don't know who they are. And young people, I'm going to tell you this morning, God knows who you are. 
you are the most authentic, whole version of what God wants to make you and has made you. In fact, before you were born, he says, I knew you in your mother's womb. I knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. And the identity issue is healed when you come into Christ. In fact, all, all of the gender issues, all of the identity issues, because people sometimes try to break it down. When you come into Christ, you get a new identity. <laughs> you get a new heart. You get a heart that's like him. You become like what Father God says you are. You, you, you begin to understand your purpose in life. and You no longer have this confusion over identity. Amen. And so when you're talking to your young people, parents, you should be talking to them to what God says they are. Sometimes you try to deal on this level what the media says and everybody else says and our schoolmates says and school systems say, but it's what God says about you. To know who you are in Him this morning. And when you understand your identity and all of that that has taken place, you begin to position yourself like Adam to what God has called us to be. And, and, and it's going to really sound distant to you this morning. But he says to subdue the earth and have dominion. God is gracious enough. In fact, he's just gracious. Amen. God is gracious enough to allow you to have questions. Now, I've said it multiple times in the church. There's some questions that God's not going to answer. So if you say, God, please don't leave me, he's not going to answer that prayer. Why? Because his word says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So you don't, you don't have to pray, God, don't leave me. Some, sometimes the issue for me, I know it's not you, but the issue for me is not what God says, it's what I hear. That's why in the New Testament it says over and over again, him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Jesus says, my sheep he hear my voice. The, when, when they ask Solomon, Solomon, what do you want? Solomon actually says, and it's a Hebrew word. I think it's, there's a, the Hebrew word is translated actually give me a, I want to hear better. What I ask God for is, God, your word is perfect, but I, I would like to hear better. And sometimes like the parable of the sower there, there, is, there is multiple voices clamoring for our attention. But when the seed of the word is sown, the seed of the word is sown, it's that what you come into. It's what God says over your life. And you begin to hear better when you, when you come into what the word says. Now here's what I want to say to you this morning, church. <clears throat> he will keep the door open for you until you have the strength to walk through it. With all of your questions. When he says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock of any man. That, the, when you take all of the Greek and everything behind that, he, it's God said, I'm going to keep the door open for you until you have the strength to walk through it. And I spent, I spent a long time when I already knew that God had an open door for me. Going through my identity issue and going through my salvation issue and my righteous issue. Before I had the strength to say, I, I, and, I, and I trust him to walk through the door, but I, I just want, I want to tell you, because I gave this word to a girl in the church recently, somebody who was here, because sometimes we think God's going to close the door. We have a certain time, and that's it. It's over. The door is closed. I just want to say to everybody in the hall, the door that you're looking for, God will keep it open until you have the strength to walk through to it. Amen. It's okay to have a second opinion. In fact, in fact, if you go to the doctor and you don't like what the doctor says, you get a second opinion. And then you'll go and you say, I don't like what the second opinion was. And you'll say, I want to see the professor. But the issue is when God speaks, it's not a second opinion. We need a second hearing test. Because when God speaks, his word is perfect. And what we need to do is say, God, I didn't quite hear you. That's why sometimes we'll hear the word of the Lord. We'll hear it from a sermon. Then we'll go to somebody else that's prophetic and say, do you have a word of the Lord for this? Because I, I, I know God has said this, but I want to just check that it's really because we're unsure of ourselves. And actually being unsure of ourselves, we're unsure of God. Abraham's encounter, Abraham didn't get everything from God on the first day. Sometimes we, we augment preachers and we augment 
people in the Old Testament and we, we put them on a pedestal and say that's a man and woman of God. But actually Abraham had a lot of failures and he had a lot of faults and he made a lot of wrong decisions. But God didn't just come to Abraham on the first day. Abraham had at least four major encounters with God. And every time he had this encounter with God, it was bringing Abraham into a deeper trust of his purpose. It's like an unfolding purposes. If God had given Israel everything on the first day when they walked into the land of promise, he said you will actually fear because you're not strong enough. They needed to know they could take Jericho before they could take the hill places. And so God is gracious enough to give you a word over your life and say this is your purpose. This is where you're going. There's a word over your life. But I'm going to have a series of places where, where you're going to need me. And I'm going, to, I'm going to renew my promise to you by the word of the Lord. And I'm going to renew my promise again by the word of the Lord. And what begins to happen is it builds trust. And it begins, good, it begins building us uh, an expectation of good things of what the Lord has promised. Yeah. And so he will never give you something to crush you. But when you see his goodness, you'll ask for more. And when you ask for more, do you know what he'll do? He'll give you the strength to match the task. Amen, church. See, Abraham's encounter was multiple, multiple versions of acts of God, of promises of God. But the reward for Abraham was God himself. What is the reward of faith? It's God. I know we come into the church and we say, well, Lord, I need healed. And we see, we see healing and we say, oh, wow, God has healed me. God is a healer. And that's what we do. Or we go in and we say, I had a financial problem. I didn't know where the door, where the provision was going to come from. And then we see God opening the door and we see the answer to our problem. We say, God, God is a provider. And we see all of that. And we see the signs. But the sign leads us to the signpost. Because eventually when you see all of the acts of God, you say, well, I want to know him. I want to know the one that promised. I don't want to know the one that said, I'm El Shaddai. I will be everything that you need when the time comes. I will be the all-sufficient one in your life. Yes, amen. amen, church. Amen. Genesis 15 and 1, it says, after God appeared to Abraham, after these things, the word of the Lord came on to Abraham in a vision. It's amazing when Solomon... God appeared to Solomon, he appeared to him in a vision, in a dream. Because your spirit man never sleeps. And Solomon said, I was asleep, but I was awake. That's what he said. And sometimes we have to strip away all of the noise because God's speaking. God has, God has a word for you. And Abraham in a vision, he says, don't be afraid. I'm going I'm to wrap up in a minute, okay? So he says, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. Did you, did you get it this morning? Whatever you're facing, God says, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. In fact, one of the translations, when he uses this term shield, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a wraparound shield. You know what you would do with a child? When a child was fearful, what do you do with a child? You know what God's doing with everybody in the hall this morning? Whatever he's saying, I don't want you to be afraid. doesn't matter what age you are. I'm your shield. And I'm your exceeding great reward. I'm the reward of faith. I, I, I'm the reward of the journey. I'm the reward of you saying yes. I'm the reward of repentance. I'm reward of life. How life works. How life should work. It's God, church. And you may study everything and you may, I have a lot of books, I love reading books, I have a lot of books, I have a lot of information about God, but they're only signposts to him. Like they heard John, but they followed Jesus. John knew, John, John said, I, I know you're coming to hear me because I'm the prophet guy. And we like this. We like this in spiritual churches. We like to hear the prophetic. We and, and we should and we embrace the prophetic. I want more prophetic. I want more dreams. I want more of it done in the right order in the church. Right. I want all. It's normal Bible. If you're, I said a few weeks ago, if God's in the house, it's prophetic. <laughs> For us, if He moves, it's supernatural. For Him, it's natural. <laughs> right. Right. 
We call it supernatural, but it's natural to him. Supernatural, God said, no, it's natural. So God's in the house, is prophetic because he's always speaking. But the reward of belief is him. The reward of belief is you being restored to your original design. Filled with the spirit of the Lord, having a constant communication with the living God. Knowing what your purpose is, knowing what your identity, knowing that God has done a great work of salvation. And just by simple belief, I get all of this. And I get him. I get him. I get what Adam lost. I get him. I am your shield, says the Lord. And I am your exceeding great reward. I didn't really get anywhere this morning with the message because I just felt I needed to stay around who you are in him and who God is. You see, if God is true, give him your life. See, if he's not, abandon him and walk away. Come let his reason. Come let his reason settle it in your heart. It's been the Father's pursuit for 4,000 years to find a way through his son that every human being in every culture could come back into full relationship with the living God. Where every person on the planet up until the cross were orphans. Had an orphan spirit. Had no concept of God as a father. And when Jesus comes, Jesus said, I'm here to show you what the father is really like. And the father says this morning in the church, I love you. I died for you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to know your true identity. Because when you find me, I have a purpose for you to live. And it's incredible. And it's powerful. And you may be the last generation that ushers in the coming of the Lord. Because at some stage, God's going to wrap it all up. And Jesus is going to come for everyone who believes. And you may be the generation that goes into a culture. And this is where I was going to go this morning. Goes into a culture that has lost their way. That are completely confused. And you may be the voice of wisdom. It, it, where it says in the book of Proverbs, the wisdom is crying to the mountains. Wisdom is crying in the streets. This is the way of the Lord. And allowing him through you to touch our cities again and our nation again before the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't we just stand? We're going to get coffee and tea. Why don't we just stand? We don't need music this morning. Did that make sense to some people this morning? Why don't you close your eyes just for a moment, everybody. Amen. If you're online this morning, why don't you just, uh, just stop where you're at this morning. Close your eyes, maybe lift your hands to the Lord. God, God has reduced salvation to the, to the most simplest common denominator. Belief in his son. Like, like it, is, it is simple. Religion has complicated the easy path to God. And all, all I want to say to you this morning, and there's a lot of people have their hands up at this point. Everybody has their eyes closed. You want to say, I think God was speaking to me this morning. And I, I, think, I think I would like to, I would like to know further what it means to believe in Jesus. I'm not bringing you out to the front. I'm, I'm not going to do any of that. But I, I just, it's an indication to me that we can have a conversation afterwards. Would you just put your hands up a little bit higher and then take it down quickly. 
Hallelujah. To anyone this morning, I feel like I feel like I've been the one that's hiding. I've been feel like I've been the one that's confused. I feel like Adam and Eve. I just didn't know if God would even accept me. And all I'm saying to you this morning, He does accept you. He does love you. He has turned in favor towards you. And all I want to say is, just let that hand go right up. Hallelujah. Father, I just bless this congregation this morning. I bless everybody that's online. I bless you because you're so good. You're so merciful. You've said, I will never turn away from doing good because of my son. And so we love you for that this morning because of your covenant. I just pray today that you would lift burdens of people. I pray for those who are looking jobs and those who are looking healing. I just pray that miracle would come, Father. I pray that your hand is not slack concerning your people. Your hand is not slack. You haven't turned away. You're not deaf, Lord. You're not, you're not hiding away from us, but you are with us and you are for us. And I just pray for favor, even for those who are looking at a house this morning. I don't know if somebody looking at a house. Just open the right door in the right neighborhood, the right schooling place. Somebody's just looking to blend in. Father, just I, just I just pray you would make it easy for your concern about all of those things that you're concerned that you want to have. As Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house. I want to come to your heart and I want to live there. So I just pray a blessing on everybody this morning. Bless saints this afternoon. This prayer would just be a really wonderful time to learn the word and to, to build friendships together. In Jesus' precious name.